I was guilty with nothing to say And they were coming to take me away But then a voice from heaven was heard that said Let him go, take me I, I should have suffered and died I should have hung on that cross in disgrace But Jesus, God's Son, took my place Crown of thorns, the deep spear deep in his side and the pain that should have been mine the rusty nails were meant for me oh yet Christ took them and let me go free and I should I should have suffered and died I should have hung on that cross in disgrace But Jesus, God's Son, took my place I should have been crucified should have suffered and died I should have hung on that cross in disgrace but Jesus God's Son took my place If you would, turn to your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. I'm pretty sure every single Sunday school class had this passage of Scripture in it this morning. And it was in the sermon this morning, one of the last passages we looked up. Philippians chapter 4, if you would. There's a lot of new phrases out there. How many of you have heard some of them? The new normal. Heard that? Yeah, social distancing. Uh, I'm trying to think of a few others, but uh, you know, it is nonsense. <laughs> We're living in a troubling time. Um, this sermon, in a lot of ways, is for me when my wife hears this sermon, she's going to be, yep, yep, you, <laughs> you need to listen to this. Um, but, you know, we're living in really a, uh, I really believe in a watershed moment for our country, uh, but perhaps uh, any day now the Lord could appear, he could call uh, home all they that are in Christ Jesus. That could happen any moment. And um, I hope that we are prepared. I know that uh, often I find myself, unfortunately, in regret, and I wish that I was much more prepared. I had a lot more people that I had brought to the Lord. But I think that a lot of times what ends up happening when we go through seasons like this, and yes, this is probably the worst and most uh, severe year of my life, um, generally speaking, but uh, the thing is, is we all have gone through hard times before. Every one of us have faced uh, tremendous trials. Every one of us have gone through various uh, tribulation. We've all had heartache. We've all had worry. 
anxiety. We've all faced these things. And the Lord is coming back. He's coming back very soon. So tonight, what I'm going to share with you is how we need to trust. Amen. How we need to follow him. But I also want to throw out one caveat. And I think this is uh, one of the most disturbing things I've seen amongst Christians today. We almost treat the world we live in with an excited apathy. The Lord's coming back any day. Yeah, he is, but uh, we're still commanded to stand up for what's right. Amen, amen. We're still commanded to take a stand. We're still commanded to communicate the gospel. We're still commanded to be faithful to the Lord and to church. And yes, the Lord is coming back any moment. But that doesn't mean that we let down our guard. And quite frankly, we're in this position today because we have. We have let our, down our guard. And tonight, this is going to be extremely positive. <laughs> right now, it doesn't sound like it, but it is going to be an extremely positive <laughs> sermon. Uh, but tonight, I want to talk about how to not let down your guard during troubling times. And uh, it, it's a really powerful thing. But I want us to look here at the very end of verse 8 of Philippians chapter 4. At the very end of it, it reads, If there be any virtue... If there be any praise, think on these things. I was reading through this passage of scripture. You know, I had never gotten this before, but if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, I want you to maybe ask it. You see, at the end of this passage of scripture, it's a period, right? It's not a question mark. It's a period. It's just a statement. But I want us to maybe ask it in a question, and I want to propose to you that it's this. It would be a rhetorical question. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And why would it be rhetorical? Well, look here in verse 4 with me. The Bible reads, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. This is a commandment. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't, uh, this isn't a pep talk. This is a decision. This is discipline. This is a commandment to rejoice in the Lord. And I want to propose this thought to you that it may be impossible to truly rejoice as a Christian outside of the Lord. It would be nearly impossible. I was thinking, uh, you know, who is the Lord to you? Who is the Lord to you? Maybe some folks shout out some things. Who is the Lord to you, personally? What? He's your Savior. Who else is He to you? Who is the Lord? Your friend. Who else? Your comforter. What else? A redeemer. He's my, he's my tower. He's my refuge. He's my very present comfort. He's, he's always there. That's who He is to me. That's who He is to us. You see, we need to be th always thinking on the Lord. Now notice this word here. It's always. It means ever present. Without ending. Without fail. Now that's hard to do. It's hard to, uh, to always think on the Lord. But the thought that is being carried is this. It ought to be our disposition. It ought to be our disposition to have the Lord in our thoughts. It ought to be in our disposition to have him carry deep within our hearts as we go out throughout the day. And I ask today, uh, is he always there in your heart? Now I'm not talking about the... The presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the presence of your mind. Is he there? You see this is a commandment to keep the Lord all the way before us. To keep our thoughts on him. And who he is. And notice with me it says. And again I say rejoice. 
That rejoicing is possible because of the work of Jesus Christ in us. It's possible because of our yieldedness to him. Look here in verse 5. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Moderation is speaking to the surrender of the soul to the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, how surrendered are you to him from moment to moment? You know, I... I we look in uh, John, and I, I believe it's, uh, well, I'm kind of passing my mind right now. I believe it's John chapter 15, it might be verse, or chapter 16. And it speaks about how the Holy Spirit convicts us of both sin and righteousness. He's both there to convict us of the things that we are doing wrong, but he's also there to affirm us for the things that we're doing right. When's the last time you felt an overwhelming presence of affirmation in your life? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. You see, this is coming down to this place of moderation, this place of personal surrender to Him. It is a discipline to stay rejoicing. It's very easy to talk about the problems. It's really easy. It's easy to point out the things that are wrong, the things we don't have, the things that are going wrong in society. In fact, the irony to this is I'll probably mention that as we go down <laughs> and get into verse 8. But if we're not careful, that becomes our only focus. And we forget very quickly the goodness of God and the wonderful things that he does in our life from moment to moment. I'm reminded of uh, Deuteronomy in chapter 6 and how we have the commandment to the home to basically not only rehearse scripture but to rehearse the miracles of God in our families. I was thinking of uh, Brother Volley when you were up here today. And one of the thoughts that came to my mind is, you know what I learned from the Volleys? I learned the power of a praying family for lost family members. I, remember, I learned that from you. I remember when they came and uh, here's this little freckled kid who told me I was throwing the ball wrong. And <laughs> he started showing me how to do it. He was on our t-ball team and uh, he became my, uh, my catching partner and uh, anyhow he, he was a good friend in my childhood and I just remember not praying uh, or praying uh, not well really probably from that day that they would come and I remember how excited I was to see you guys pull up and not long after y'all were saved I remember almost every Sunday night when we prayer request praying for family members and seeing folks get saved and seeing people coming through the doors and getting baptized and sitting in the seats that's powerful Amen. that's awesome if we're not careful though we'll get so focused on the bad things happening in the present that we'll forget to let that moderation be known amongst all men that moderation that God is good Amen. And that we can rejoice in him. And we can have a smile on our face. A few weeks ago, I was dealing with some customer service issues. Uh, my job is really to sell flooring, but I've probably done more customer service resolution than most of the managers in the store. <laughs> And um, I was kind of complaining about it, and one of my managers, his name is Tuesday, and he goes, Caleb, you know why we're having you do all this stuff? And I said, no. And he goes, because you can do it with a smile. He goes, he goes I, I'll get too angry with these guys. And, you know, our moderation ought to be known amongst all men. Yes, it's speaking about self-discipline, but tonight I want to just focus in on the discipline of being surrendered to the Lord and trusting in His goodness. He is good. Amen. He's good. And we can trust Him. We may not understand what He's doing. We may not understand what is happening all around us, but we understand that God is faithful. He's the same today. 
He's the same tomorrow. Amen. He's going to always be the same. And he is faithful. Amen. And we can trust in that. Because the truth is, he is good. And he's always good. I want you to notice, though, that we are to do this because the Lord is at hand. You know who is not faithful? The devil. You know who's not faithful? The world. You know who's not faithful? Sin. This, ver this verse, when it talks about the Lord is at hand, that word hand is speaking of the presence of God. The Lord is at hand. Literally, how can I be right with God? How can I have his presence in my heart and life at this moment if I cannot obey the commandment to rejoice in him? If we're not careful, we'll start going off, uh, being super frustrated about the things that are happening in this world, and we lose the power of God. It's important that we're, sp that we're filled with his presence, because the Lord is at hand. There are people who do not have God. There are people who do not have heaven. They don't have the hope of God's uh, presence. They don't have the hope of salvation. How's our disposition? Are we trusting him? Are we rejoicing in him? It's all about his presence in this moment. It's all about the fact that he's coming back. It's all about the, the fact that right now God wants to use us as vessels, as salt and light in this earth. If in the time of panic God's people are walking around with a mopey face, and anxiety deep within our hearts and minds. How is that light? How is that salt? I want you to look here with me, if you would, in verse 7. Well, I'm sorry, in verse 6. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, your requests be made known unto God. God wants us to trust in him. Be careful for nothing. It means don't be anxious. Don't be filled with anxiety. This also is a commandment. This is also a discipline. It's a decision that I have to make in the moment to not be filled with anxiety. All of us have so many responsibilities weighing on us at any moment. We have so many things ahead of us. We have family members we love. We have a nation to think about. Liberties that are literally weighing in the balance. And if we're not careful, we can choose to put off the discipline of not being anxious. The discipline of trusting God. I kind of liken it to this. Um, how many of y'all played baseball, softball? Anybody? Remember when you were learning how, how to bat? And you're swinging for the, the ball and that person who's pitching accidentally hits you. Anybody have that happen? I, uh, a lot of times my dad would have Kyle and I practice and Kyle would accidentally hit me uh, quite a bit. And if I wasn't careful, what would happen is I would be hesitant when it was time to actually bat. And I would close my eyes instead of keeping my eye on the ball. And when it came time to swing, you know what I did? I closed my eyes. Because I was about 50-50% sure of where that ball was when it was going to hit me. Now, if we're not careful, we, we know that we're going to have an opportunity. We know that we're about to step into a batting box... We're about to step in here, and we know any moment that the pitch is coming, and if we're filled with anxiety, we're not going to respond the right way. 
We're supposed to be going to the Lord in prayer. It says very clearly right here, it says, and, uh, but, uh, by, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. To supplicate means to go, uh, to go in one, uh, to, to go to the Lord in one's be, or uh, on one's behalf. Uh, it means to, uh, to go and not so much to ask, but again to ask for someone else. I saw a post on Facebook not too long and it broke my heart. How many of you guys have been frustrated by no ends with Colin Kaepernick's kneeling down on his knee? Anybody else? Oh my goodness, me too. And then I find out this guy's girlfriend is a radical Muslim. And her Ennam has had a great deal of influence on him. And I find all this stuff, and you know what it does to me? It makes me even more upset. I remember as a little kid, we were up in Anthony Lakes, and it was during, or, uh, during the Clinton administration. And all the trials were going on. I probably was about 10 or 11 years old. And all the adults were talking, and I just piped up and I said, I can't stand the Democrats. I hate the Democrats. And my grandma goes, I'm a Democrat. Do you hate me? Oh. They always did that so that they could get the lesser of two evils. But anyhow, <laughs> it was a, a moment that caught me off guard. And the other day when I was on Facebook, this moment caught me off guard. This lady talked about how she too was disgusted at his actions. But she sent him the book done. And she's been praying for him to be saved. And I thought to myself, I, I didn't do that. I haven't done that. There are people destroying our cities who want this nation to fall. They want everything that makes this nation great, everything that we hold dear, to be ripped from our hands. Will we pray for them? Will we ask God for them to be saved? I want also to maybe point this out. Perhaps if you were 17 years old, and if you had literally been taught that the pilgrims came here not to, per, not to flee religious persecution, but that the pilgrims came here to imperialize the natives and commit chemical warfare on them, you'd probably think the same thing. But that's what our public schools are teaching our kids. It's not that they're literally insane running through the streets. No, that is what our schools are teaching our kids. And that's what they've been taught for about 15 or 20 years. We have got to really go to the Lord in prayer about these issues. How can we rejoice in the Lord if we're not taking the greatest needs of our country to Him? Because he is the one who can fix it. He's the one who can fix it. But literally, our children are being taught this. I was speaking with a young lady the other day. She's about to graduate from uh, Oregon State University with an English degree. She wants to be an editor. She will finish without ever taking one course in English. She is really a literature major. But the school is calling her an English major. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. And our school, our, our money paid for that. This young lady thinks she can be an editor. And there's a number of magazines already talking with her. Trying to get her to come and work for them. She's going to be an editor and she doesn't know how to parse a sentence. Doesn't know how to diagram. She's going to be an editor. 
my point is not that, not that we should focus on the problem. My point is there's only one person who can solve the problem. Amen. Right? And we need to take that problem to God. Oh, right? Amen. That's who is going to change things. And then we need to speak about the problem as if God is going to solve the problem. That's what we need to do. We need to do this with thanksgiving and anticipation that he will solve the problem. You know what would help solve the problem today? Revival. Amen. Revival through our nation. Where is the prayer for revival? Where's the prayer that God would change our lives, personally, our lives, and our community, and then our country and our world? It's a discipline we must trust in him. And then let your requests be made known unto God. And then bring the problem personally that you have to God. Look in verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. Now I want you to notice that word keep. It means to guard. He will guard our hearts. He will guard our minds. If we choose to rejoice in the Lord, if we choose to pray through our problems, He will protect, He will keep our hearts and our minds. How many of you would be honest and say, there have been... During these last 10, 12 weeks, there's been some breaking moments for you. Just filled with anxiety, fear, frustration, teary-eyed. Anybody else? Me too. You know what we need? We need the most simple thing a Christian could possibly have. We need the presence of God. That's what we need. But it is found... In the discipline of rejoicing in God, in following God, in trusting God. But it's also found in our thoughts. Look here in verse 8. We're almost done. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report... True. Here's what it means. Truth. Truth. Can I tell you some hard truths? Do you know that police brutality is true? It is true. It affects every single community in our nation as far as race. It's true. It's also true that racism exists. It's true. You know what's not the truth? That the police are specifically targeting every single person walking about. <laughs> that's, that's also not the truth. Right? And what I'm kind of getting at is uh, the next one, the next point is honest, and that's objectivity. Objectivity. And if, if we're not careful, what will happen is someone will say a statement and it, we've already been programmed to think of everything as black and white and we will respond in a moment's notice. But are we being objective? Because what did, what did Jesus say about our speech? He said to be as, as what is it, harmless as, as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. We have to be wise about what we say. We have to be wise about how we respond. And that can't happen if we're not objective. If we don't acknowledge some truths that are happening. Because here's the truth is to win over, you have to relate. You have to understand. People need people to understand each other. 
You know one of the reasons why the gospel is so powerful? Because it's based on principles that everyone can relate to. Amen. We all have sinned. We all are imperfect. We all are in need of a savior. We all are living a life. We all will die. Right? These are basic truths. And you know what? When we come down to the complexities of our culture that we live in today, those basic truths are still there. All we need to do is be focused in on what is true, what is honest, what's just, what is righteous. What's righteous? And that should be our demand. What is righteous? What is pure? What's morally right? I, uh, lovely. You know, I was looking this one up and it means to be filled with compassion or to have a disposition of compassion. Where is our compassion? Because if we're not careful, right? If we're not careful, we'll be filled up with malice and frustration and bitterness and hate and the pendulum just continues to swing. It's only the work of Christ that will truly unite this world and His compassion working through our hearts. And notice finally of good report. And this means to bestow thoroughly the benefit of the doubt. Good report. Here's what I mean by that. We hear something, like for instance, my, uh, I was on my way into work the other day and uh, five people three weeks ago had been tested positive for uh, COVID-19. I'm driving into work and it says just three weeks later, seven times that number. There's 900,000 people in Multnomah County. That's 35 people. But it was presented as seven times that number. You follow me? That's not a good report. That's not good. That's not, that's not, thoroughly, uh, that's not thoroughly answering the problem. And notice here with me, if you would, at the very end, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Virtue is moral excellence. It's literally standing in the right morally. Praise is the acknowledgement of God's working in our lives. It's the acknowledgement of his goodness. Two thoughts for you. Praise and virtue are the byproducts of trusting God. And peace and rejoicing are the byproducts of entrusting God. Amen. And so tonight, my message is just very simple. Rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Very Rejoice in Him. It's a discipline. We surrender to Him.